to them. So glad you're here. So today I'm going to be talking about sled dogs, and just for curiosity's sake, how many of you guys have ever met a sled dog, read about sled dogs, or been to one of my talks? Okay, good. So a decent amount. Okay, excellent. So that helps me build up a little bit of a base. If you were unsure, um, you know, this is what we're talking about, right? Actual sled dogs. And what um, I kind of want to know is we're not doing basics, you know, this is what they are, and this is who they are, and where they live. This is talking about kind of how sled dogs might relate to you as veterinarians. And this may, means kind of the fundamental understanding of how they live, how they're worked with, how they're fed, and maybe some medical issues that you might encounter that's a little more prominent in the sled dog world versus in the common dog world. They're, they're pets, yes, but they're also working animals. So there's kind of that um, co-worker relationship versus just here's Fido that lives on my couch. So we're gonna kind of cover a few topics to go over some differences that you may notice if you have a mushroom client. So just a quick basic about them. So the sled dog is any breed that can pull. It's not necessarily gonna be a husky or a malamute. It can be literally anything. Hound dogs, you see a lot of hounds racing nowadays in sprint. They're generally the fastest dogs on the planet at the moment as far as sled dogs go. Um, so it might be a little unconventional, but if someone walks in with their German short hair pointer and goes, that's my sled dog, you could probably believe them because it's probably true. Um, so any of these dogs, Siberians, Nomiads, um, Chinook dogs, the most common is called an Alaskan Husky, and it's essentially just a mutt. Generally, it's some kind of Siberian Husky mixed with a hound or a Saluki or some kind of sight hound to make them faster. Um, so they don't, they're not a purebred, it's just they're called Alaskan Huskies generically. So if someone classifies your dog as that, that's what they're referring to. Common denominator is they're super high drive. This includes generally very prey driven, so if any small animals are in your clinic, just be advised that these dogs are really very interested in chasing small furry things. Um, so don't let a cat loose in the same room. Just saying. Um, but the drive is really what, what differentiates them from every other random dog, is if your dog doesn't have the drive to pull, you basically have a sled that doesn't move. You can't push that rope, you're not dragging them along. They're in front of you and are strictly going off of verbal commands. So kind of to set that baseline, that's what's the real, differentiating um, aspects, I guess. A kind of a misconception is people think they're kind of aloof, that working dogs are just working dogs that they don't have anything to do with the people. If you've ever read Jack London, they're just these kind of brutal beasts that don't have anything to do with the people. They live to run in their traces and that's it. They live to eat and run. And that's partly true. They do love to eat and run, but it doesn't mean they're not affectionate. So they're usually very, very loyal to their people. Um, they love being around people. Little kids love to come up to the truck and meet the dogs and all that kind of stuff. So they're really rather affectionate, at least in my experience. I've rarely met a dog that doesn't want some kind of pets or hugs or cookies or something like that. And if anyone ever doubted the excitement, I wanted to point out this guy. That face. <laughs> <laughs> that face doesn't say, I'm happy to be here and doing what I'm doing, and I really don't know what was. And these are my the dog pair that a friend is borrowing right now. Um, that one's mine, and that one's from the kennel I run with, but they've run with me for many years. And, I don't guess you have to click back here. So just to drive home the point of how excited these guys are, uh, it's not gonna work now. Oh, there we go. Maybe, just gonna think about it. So this is kind of what they sound like when you're hooking them up and getting them ready to go, which is quite a, a loud sound, especially when there's multiple teams. But this is just one in particular that's getting ready to go for a run. <laughs> so I'm pretty sure every one of these guys is really interested in hitting down that trail. And that guy can't get his feet on the ground, that one definitely can't. All of them are barking, they're excited, that guy's like, I just want to go, can you just carry on? So you can see that these guys love what they do. It's not something that we're forcing them to do, it's not something that they hate to do, you know, they, they want to do what they were bred to do. So first kind of topic, we'll start kind of at a young age and move on up into other things, but when they're little itty bitty puppies, we remove their dip claws. Most people think of that as a cosmetic surgery, just like cropping tails or ears or something like that. But for sled dogs, it's not confirmational, 
and it has nothing to do with the way they look or just you know whatnot. It's partly a convenience factor, yes, and it's partly a medical factor. So what kind of the main drive home point is that there's just a kind of potential for some foot issues, which people think, well, they use the dew claws, and yes, that may be true for dogs that take tight turns, those dew claws do help doing things like that. But for a sled dog, you're not taking those super you know the super sharp turns that you would do in agility or something of that nature and what the big problem is is there's booties that are used which sounds funny people are like oh my gosh it's a booty it's just a little shoe that goes over their foot so if you've seen dogs with a little feet they usually walk like this mm -hmm. you know that's what a booty is except for sled dogs it's a super common piece of equipment i'll show you a picture in just a minute um, also as opposed to the regular dog that you just walk on a leash they sit in your house most of the time these guys are around lines, grates, chains, all this stuff all the time. They constantly have their feet along the lines. They step on their lines all the time when they're hooked in. And so there's way more potential for getting that toe that's, you know, kind of hanging off on the side to get caught on things. Thankfully, I haven't seen very many problems, but then again, most of the dogs around don't have dew claws, so there may have been a higher incidence. So this is kind of what age we have when we remove those dew claws. This was the litter that my dog was from, and I'll show you. There it is. But they're usually between two and six days old. There's various ways of removing them. Everyone has their way. Some use a local, some don't. Some use super glue, some use little clippers. And there's about this big, you know, any, 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 any things. And that's why a lot of people are like, oh gosh, this is a terrible thing to do. However, like I put up here, a little bit of money, a couple day recovery is generally speaking in the sled dog world, in the working dog world, is a lot better than spending, you know, $200 later to anesthetize your dog that has chronic problems with its foot. And you can see here, this is when my dog is about four months old. He doesn't have his dew claws anymore. It fills up really nice. Can't even really tell where it is. It might have a little scar, but it's basically non-existent. You can't tell as long as it's done right. And I'll show you why. So these are booties, and they protect the dog's feet. And you can see this is where the dew claws exist on a husky. And this is right where you strap on those booties. Booties protect the dog's feet. They're there for their protection. They're not just there for show. They're not for their own feet are cold. It's generally speaking, um, you know, if you're on abrasive surfaces, which can include snow, there's stuff called corn snow that can be super abrasive and just rub their paws off, just like if you ran your dog on pavement really hard. Same story, it would just rub that pad off. Um, so same thing, we want to make sure they have tough feet, but you know, they're not invincible. They're made of human stuff too. So, They'll loop of ice balls in between their toes. They'll get just these little balls. If you have a long-haired dog and live in the snow, you might have seen your dog get these little ice balls in between their feet. It's super uncomfortable. It can cause rubs, abrasions, things like that. Um, my dog actually will sit there and limp like her foot is broken when she gets one in her toes. <laughs> so booties are absolutely indispensable. It's something especially distance mushers will use. So the dew claw removal, generally speaking, especially for a large kennel or PD distance, is not really up for negotiation. If you want to deal with that problem, you may regret it later because a lot of times people will leave the new claws on and go, oh my gosh, I regret it, you know, three years down the line when, you know, I have to put on booties all the time and it just, the thumb rubs against their foot because it's strapped on tight so it doesn't fall off. And there's just this rub, 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 and it can cause chronic issues and a lot of pain for the dog. Um, so this is kind of a preventative measure just to, for the future use. And it seems a little silly when they're little, but when they're so small, they heal quick and it lasts for a lifetime, they don't have this problem. So another thing that a lot of people are like, oh my gosh, no, is tethering. Tethering is like bad words in the dog world. But tethering is an essential part of most sled dogs' lives. If you have anything more than a few dogs, it can be really hard to set up pens for everyone. I actually came up with some numbers where in order to get the same, these are the kennel that I work with, and there's a post you can see with a chain. These are about six feet long, and they have this circle to go around in their house, they each have their own house and water bucket, water bucket and all that stuff. Um, so the space that you get out of a six foot chain, the radius that you get, it's about 113 square feet for them to run around this chain. So that's about 113 square feet-ish. If you wanted the same equivalent in a pen uh, made out of chain link, which is usually what you need, you would need approximately a 10 by 12 kennel to provide 120 square feet, which is fairly close. In size, that's a lot of paneling. That would be for one dog, but most people won't keep just one dog in a pen because if you have 20 dogs, that's 20 pens. It's 10 by 12. That's an awful lot of money adding up right there. It's a lot of space and it's a lot of maintenance for maintaining just 20 dogs. And most people 
especially when you start to compete, don't just have 20 dogs. Usually it's higher numbers getting into 30, 40, 50, some people have 100. So this is a kind of a herd management thing. I've actually had some, I way, I'm a proponent of these because I've seen kennel setups with the pens and I've seen problems with dogs fighting because they can't escape to their own space. So kind of the pros of tethering, um, it's super carefully planned. It's not just someone, everyone thinks of that sad looking pit bull that's starved and in, you know, in the mud and they have embedded collars and all that and they don't know how to interact with people. Very, very different. These kennels are very specifically planned, shade for the dog, the powder position, north, south, east, west, it's specifically positioned for wherever you live to provide shade at all times of the day. They're really nice houses, I guarantee they cost a little over a hundred bucks to build because I've built a few. Um, you know, their water is attached to their house so they can't, you know, knock it over and not have water. In the winter we go out and give them hot water a few times a day to make sure they're nice and hydrated because hydration is one of those super important nutrients. Um, drainage, you want to make sure that if the ground isn't absorbent, there's a way to drain it off if you have a rocky place. We don't want them sitting in super wet conditions. Um, you know, and they have free movement. They're not stuck on a city bitty, you know, six inch chain and have, you know, that 113 square feet to go run around and do whatever they want. They also learn, and this is a skill that most dogs don't need, but these dogs are around, like I said, lines all the time. So negotiating that chain, actually really, you can tell the difference between dogs that were penned and dogs that were tethered because they know how to get to be, you know, deal with that chain and move their feet without thinking about it so they're not tripping and falling on their face and whatnot. So it's a super helpful thing once they get put on the lines. Um, it helps the musher know what each dog is doing every day. The poop that goes in, the pee that goes out, you know, poop that goes in, it comes out. <laughs> It's cleaned every day. You can see there's not, you know, mounds of poop hanging anywhere. It's super clean. They go at least once a day. Some people more often. It just depends on kind of your work schedule and all of that. Um, so the mushroom knows exactly what's going on. When you go and scoop the kennel, which is, honestly, I kind of like scooping the kennel because you can say hi to every dog. <laughs> you scoop the poop, or I like to scoop the poop first so that we're not stepping in it. You know, scoop the poop first, and then they go up on the house, and you cuddle, or you get belly rubs, or you play, or do whatever. And you get to do that for every single dog. You don't waste time going in and out of pen. You just walk from dog to dog and go to so have everyone. It also, um, and I'll show this later in the video, you know, inappropriate dog ride interaction, like I said, they have a place to escape. They're not stuck with their neighbor in a pen. They can go into their house or away from the next dog. They can interact, and it's close enough they don't get, you know, tied up with each other, but they get to play with each other, or they can just walk away and say, hey, I don't feel like playing right now. And then, like I said, daily cleaning and interaction. They're just not out there sitting by themselves for days and days. This is a father-son pair, and they love being neighbors. Aww. They play, they hang out, they cuddle. You know, they like being buddies. But this is a lot of them. They like to just hang out and play with each other. So it's not as terrible and isolating as some might have you think. And I'll show you, and this is when I went home, so they were all pretty excited to see me. Mm -hmm. This guy Ash, you know, he's excited to see me know where that chain ends and he uses it to get up and say hi to me, come up for hugs. He says, that's great, that's super fun. And this is the video I wanted to show you guys. So I don't know if you can see, but these guys are just having a really grand time playing. This is someone else's kennel, this isn't ours, but they can walk away, come back, do a little run around thing, and they're having a great time. There's no, no sadness, no being upset here. And then when they decide oh, I need a break, he doesn't have to be there in this guy's face. He can just step aside and say, I'm done now. So there's definitely, especially in a multi-dog setup, there's some benefits to having that um, tether setup. The nutrition is a huge deal. I know if you've been to the nutrition class, um, Dr. Hamley did mention slow dogs a few times because they have unique nutritional requirements. Calories is really the big deal. Calories is very hard to get into. Um, nutrients, especially water, like I said, the hydration thing is kind of a big deal. If they're not hydrated, they're not even functioning properly, not performing at peak performance. Getting them to eat the calories is, is a big kicker. Um, I did the calculation for my 40 something pound dogs, it was about 20 kilograms. And on this regular day, not doing anything, just as regular energy requirement, about 670 kilocalories, which is already um, you know, a decent amount, not too bad for a 40 pound dog. But when you start doing work, you do two times, which is basically him doing nothing, he's intact and whatnot, so I mean, it's essentially nothing. Um, you know, it's getting up to 100 and, you know, I'll call it 1,340 calories, but it can go up to 11 times their resting. 
energy requirements, right? So five to 11, and um, I don't know the number, sir, but he got up to over 7,000 calories and he was doing 11 times the resting energy requirement. How do you get 7,000 calories in a dog? That is an awful lot. Really, the answer is fat. <laughs> Put fat. And so there's this really nice looking stuff. Don't sniff it, you won't like it. Don't taste it, it's gross. And what this is basically, it's a raw meat mix of fat and just lard and raw meat chunks, whatever it is. And a lot of people go, oh my gosh, raw meat, you know, that's terrible. But then the sled dogs go, we gotta get these guys to eat. We gotta get them to eat. It has a higher water content, it's pretty calorie dense. You don't want to eat it, which is fantastic. Even then, sometimes you'll be like, oh, I'm full, I don't want to go on bed, you know. It's a constant battle, and I can't even get my dog to eat on the least weekend because he's too excited. Grr. <laughs> Um, you know, it's this mush that you mix up, and uh, so if the client comes to you saying, yeah, we feed our dogs a mixture of meat and kibble, don't be surprised because it's pretty standard fare. Um, it definitely helps you get those calories in, it helps them eat, and uh, you know, they're, they're aware of the risk that there is, you know, raw meat is being handled, but a lot of times they're frozen in chunks and you just throw it to the dogs and mix it up like this in some hot water and give it to them to get those calories in. Also low cost, the raw meat helps offset premium kennel cost, you know, um, kibble costs since a bag of premium kibble, kibble can be awful expensive for just a bag when you're feeding 40 dogs, it's expensive. Whole fish people will feed, you know, kind of whatever, they'll roll them out in these buckets and feed them. Super important. There's just kind of some stuff I said, you know, fat, they can be up to 25 to 50% of what they need in a day, which is extraordinarily high compared to your average dog. Um, also, vitamin E is a problem because of all the food is that get metabolized and so they need that vitamin E requirement to get rid of those free radicals. Protein is also higher than most, um, but that's not really where the calories are coming from, it's the fat. Uh, and like I said, five to 11 times RER is really what these sled dogs might use. So kind of medical issues that you might run into that you will be a little surprised about, gastric ulcers is a huge problem, and especially in the distance racing world, but I was talking to some other people and they said that sprint racing dogs also have this problem. They're not really sure why. They kind of come up with theories. Is it like stress diarrhea? Um, you know, and all this, you know, stress causing the pH changes. What is it? They're not really sure. Um, but point is, it's a problem. And so dogs will kind of have a little bit of anemia or whatnot just from these gastric ulcers that have formed, particularly studied on stuff like the Iditarod race and the Yukon Quest, which are a thousand mile races. And so to combat that, they have found that omeprazole or promotin is ideal, but especially omeprazole. So if teams are coming in and they have their dogs prophylactically on a meprazole, that's pretty common fare and has really taken care of a lot of the gastric ulcer issues that they've seen in the past. Uh, so don't be surprised about that. Hypothermia, if you went and took a temperature with a sled dog right after they got off the line, you might be a little surprised and think, oh my gosh, this dog should be dead. But they're not, they're fine. 104 to 107 is not uncommon. Someone even anecdotally told me that 110 degrees in the dog is fine. It has more to do about how they cool and less about how hot they get. Um, they're generally pretty good at cooling down really fast. The problem is when they're super hot and they stay that hot. And I'm not sure you know what to look for when they're running their team. Um, I had one dog over heat one time and I could just tell because she stepped funny. She didn't collapse or anything, she stepped funny. But you work with these dogs so long, mushers generally will know something's up. Um, but don't be surprised if you work a race and the dog has, you know, under an eight, don't fall over backwards, they're probably fine. <laughs> Kind of here, like I said, booties. Um, some people use ointments. They put like a salve in between the toes to keep um, you know, the eye falls out or keep them um, kind of moving smoothly if there's something in between. Frostbite is a problem sometimes, not very often, but it can be, especially on the male penis and ears and nipples sometimes. So there are coats that mushers will use to cover those parts to make sure that the dogs are safe. Not a big problem in the lower 48, except for some places like the greater uh, Lake Day, Great Lakes area, but not most of the other places. Again, raw meat diets, you know, there's problems with that. Salmonella, salmonellosis, which isn't a huge problem. Specific areas, if your client says, hey, I wanna feed my certain my dogs fish. Um, some places have specific problems, salmon poisoning in the Pacific Northwest is a huge issue that I had a discussion with someone's like, oh, well, just feed them fish, you know, feed them salmon, it's fine, from someone in Alaska. And I said, whoa there, maybe not, because if you live in Washington or Oregon, you don't do this, because this is something that's gonna get all your dogs sick and you're gonna be full of all kinds of regret. Beaver also, when they eat hemlock, they can give the dog hemlock poisoning. A lot of people will chop up beaver tail because it's fat. It's essentially just fat, and they'll feed it to their dogs for a high calorie treat and they don't know that they can get hemlock poisoning from doing that. So what they're feeding is a problem. Um, sometimes deep responsive dermatosis, 
is a problem. I don't know why, but northern green dogs seem to have like a, a predisposition of having this. Um, I'm not really sure why. But you can just treat it with zinc um, to fix that. Like I said, vitamin E deficiency, making sure that those super high fat content foods have enough vitamin E to take care of all those free radicals. Um, thiamine, thiamine, I can't say it right. Toxicosis, um, basically means it's breaking down all that vitamin D that they need, and so you need to supply them with the vitamin D to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, diarrhea and dehydration, uh, like I said, stress diarrhea happens when they run sometimes, not every dog. You don't really know why it's not like some marathon runners have the same problem, it just depends on the dog. This can be somewhat helped by only feeding them once a day, which sounds funny and people are like, oh my gosh, not once a day. But if you feed them a couple hours after they run and then they're not going to run for another 24 hours if you're just doing regular training and whatnot, it gives them a lot of time to move all that food out of their, their digestive system and the most time to get it out and it causes a lot less problem. Um, something called sequel slap might be part of that where their guts are just flopping around and all that food inside is just smacking around and irritating the mucosal lining of their intestines. So that's uh, you know, no way to totally prevent it, but we, we try. Um, exertional rhabdomyolysis, like you know in horses, is the same thing as sled dogs. It's going to be a problem from that muscle breakdown. Um, exercise induced asthma, a lot of times this does happen. Um, it'll resolve in a few days after a long distance race. It's usually super cold temperatures and generally doing prolonged exercise. So it's not like, oh, I took my dog for three miles. It's the dog's running. 10s, 20, 30, 40, 100 miles a day, whatever it is. And then cardiac changes, this is something uh, that I have experienced myself. My dog has what is recorded in his medical records as a murmur, but there's nothing, you know, no signs of it, no physical, you know, signs of anything, no symptoms. And a lot of times they have exercise-induced enlargement. Um, you might have an increased silhouette on x-rays. Great cardio is super common. I mean, they're super athletic, so they just have really slow heartbeats when they're resting. Um, and then these murmurs that you may hear is just from this higher stroke volume and increased velocity across the aortic valves. I see those people go, oh my gosh, but he's a super athletic dog that's training. They're going to have a bigger heart, generally speaking. Um, so just be aware that this might not be a pathological issue. It might just be physiological. And the most important thing you know is mushrooms like to do it themselves. So don't be surprised if your runner doesn't want to take 40 of their dogs in to deal with vaccines, to do new floor removals, to do any of that stuff. A lot of them will learn just how to deal with themselves. So don't be shocked, try to work with them. I know it sounds like every other that wants to do it themselves, but they don't have 50 dogs to take care of. So keep that in mind when you're treating your clients, know that they have a lot of dogs and that you're dealing with a herd health management issue, not a single pet issue. So be aware of that when you're recommending treatments. If someone's got fleas, they all got fleas. If someone got worms, you gotta do them all. So be advised of that when you're giving medical advice and dealing with these people, know that they want what's best for their dogs, but it might look a little different from your average Joe in Fido. So that's it. Um, yeah, just pictures of me and my dogs, and that's my first dog. In case anyone wanted to know, she started me. So you don't have to have a husky; you can use a mutt. <laughs> but uh, thanks, you guys, for listening. And if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer. I know it's about time to go to class, so whatever uh, floats your boat, I'll leave you with this video to watch along. Does anyone have any questions? Mm -hmm. um, do you Mm -hmm. Yeah, so she asked if people ask for vets to come out to their place, and yes, that's super common. Um, or someone will literally load up their truck with, you know, 20 dogs and go and do like a vaccine run for rabies, you know, or something like that. Some people that are in like Bush, Alaska or Canada, they can't reach a veterinarian, which is partly why this DIY, you know, thing came around is people are too far away, they can't just go to the vet, they have to deal with it right now, and you know, they're too far from civilization to, to deal with it with a veterinarian, um, which is why you might do some phone calls because <laughs> that's all you can do. But yes, some people will make a dedicated trip at certain times of the year to do vaccines or checkups or whatever it is that they need to do. Does that answer your question? Anyone else have a question? Okay. Thanks. All right. Thanks. Well,